Up next, we have something that caught my eye that's very special from B-Link. The GTR series. This is a 7000 series mobile processor and it's in a mini PC. In my case, a dark green one. 32 gigabytes of memory, one terabyte of storage, Wi-Fi 6, 2.5 gigabit LAN. This is 120 watts. What can you do with a 120 watt power budget? Well, let's take a look. <laughs> watt power budget you say 7000 series mobile processor you say I, things have been strange because like in the market with the macroeconomic conditions i guess and then laptops that are based around 6000 series it seems like just yesterday we had 6000 series mobile processors from amd and now we have 7000 series mobile processors from amd and this is you know ryzen 7 class processors not even ryzen 9 but this is the 7840 hs h meaning zoom so this is the gtr7 from b-link and yes, they've gotten fancy with their boxes. And for a mini PC, this is pretty weighty, very heavy. All right, let's take it apart. Hello. hello. No, it, it literally, it, it says hello on the box. I mean, hello. Basic operation and after service. Okay, okay. Ooh, modular RAM. Okay, look at that, a ribbon. Good lord, that's a brick of a mini PC. They put the stickers on the bottom for Ryzen 7 and Radeon graphics. That's nice. I, I, I approve. <laughs> Might have overdone it a little bit with the GTR branding, but I think they're proud of what they've done here. There's also a power button combination fingerprint sensor in the top, so you've got some security here. That's a little bit of a premium feature. It's basically a laptop, not in a laptop form factor. We've also got two mounting screws here, which will help you mount this to your Visa mounting bracket. Dual LAN at the rear. Oh, enthusiasts are going to really like that. Four USB Type A ports at the rear, HDMI, and full size display port. Two USB Type C and a combination of headphone microphone at the front and rear. At the front, we've got a USB Type A and a USB Type C. Kind of a big clear CMOS button. Oh, it's pretty easy to hit that. I think I might have preferred to have clear CMOS at the rear. I also can't help but notice that the rear is entirely dominated by heatsink exhaust. Oh, there's more hello on the back. Congratulations, you get our latest product. We adjust the maximum TDP from the of the 7840HS to from 54 watts to 65 watts. B-Link Advanced Technology belongs to you. Yes, so they're telling you that the profile processor configuration is 65 watts. Now, technically, this is not an overclock because AMD does actually support these higher TDP features of their processors. It's just that usually you don't see 65 watts in a laptop. Unless you're team blue, right? Uh, no, seriously though. I mean, you can turbo that high, but usually it doesn't, it's diminishing returns. But in this form factor, it's basically a mini desktop computer. Okay, maybe it makes sense. Also in the box, you get a large 120 watt power brick. Let's get this weird funky connector. So don't lose this power brick. You're never gonna be able to replace the power brick. We got a really short HDMI cable, a longer HDMI cable, and a Visa mounting adapter. So you screw this into the, the B-Link machine, and then on the other side is your 75 or 110 millimeter mounting holes so that you can mount it to the back of your monitor where the Visa mount normally is. The feature that we've seen before. Now you may be wondering, well, if they've tuned the processor to be 65 watts, what's the other 65 watts for? Power delivery, LAN, Dual M.2, yeah, you could run RAID 0 or RAID 1 M.2 with this, so you can get, this is kind of getting into quasi-workstation territory, although without a dedicated GPU or a separate GPU processing chip. Plus all the USB, plus the Type-C, plus everything else. 120 watts makes sense. It's definitely a weird little magnetic connector thing. You can definitely hear the fan. It's probably doing the initial DDR5 training. Before we get super deep into the nitty gritty, let's do a teardown and see what we're working with. I always love what B-Link is doing with their, their builds because it's a nice heavy metal construction. There's no plastic here. I mean, the vent, the breather, the side panels, the sort of built-in dust filter, it's gonna accumulate dust on the top so you have to dust it so that it's got breathability. Oh boy, a lot of fun things to like about the design. When you take the bottom off, you're greeted by this gray plastic shroud with a fan and a heat sink. The heatsink is designed to cover the controller part of your SSD. See, a lot of people really, they don't fully understand 
The NAND part of your SSD doesn't really care about the heat. I mean, it does a little bit, but mostly NAND actually works better when it's running a little hot. It's the controller that will throttle when it starts getting north of, you know, 70, 80, 90, 105 C, depending on what the controller is. Equipped in our, in our GTR7 is a Crucial. It's a P3P. So that's sort of the commodity value PCIe Gen 4 uh, QLC flash drive. It doesn't get particularly hot. Unfortunately, it exposes an incorrect assumption that B-Link made when they designed the gray plastic thing. And I think they're probably going to end up having to revise the gray plastic thing a little bit. And that is, the heatsink doesn't actually make contact with the controller. You see, in this era of Gen 5 SSDs, a lot of the Gen 5 designs move the controller to the middle of the SSD instead of right on the edge. The reason it was located originally right on the edge was because of signal integrity. You didn't really have to have read drivers, you didn't have to have a lot of complicated uh, signal integrity circuitry inside the microcontroller itself. It could just physically be close to the M.2 slot, and you could be assured that it would link up with those fancy newfangled PCIe 4 Gen speeds, because everybody struggled with PCIe 4 speeds on the motherboards and connectors and everything else in the beginning. In 2023, PCIe Gen 4 speeds aren't really much of a problem because we've moved on to PCIe 5 and 6 in some cases. I mean, at the bleeding edge, a lot of these connectors are being qualified P for PCIe 6. So the controller moves to the middle of the SSD. Unfortunately, and you can see this in the pink thermal pads that are connected to the heatsink here in our B-Link, the controller doesn't actually touch the heatsink. The controller is just sort of floating there. Now, this turns out not to be fatal for two reasons. One, our Crucial P3P doesn't run all that hot to begin with. It doesn't even really need very much airflow. And two, there is a ton of airflow from the fan that is directly over top of the controller. So as design flaws go, this is pretty benign. Other than that, there's actually a lot to be excited about under here. First, the power connector. It's replaceable, it's modular. So that's good at least. Second thing, the DDR5 is modular and user replaceable. I've got 32 gigabytes of Crucial 5600 in here, but 64 gigabytes is entirely possible in this configuration. Also, dual M.2, yeah, dual 2280. The BIOS on this thing is fully unlocked. We'll talk more about that in a minute. You can run NVMe RAID 0 or RAID 1 for mirroring, which is a really nice setup in this configuration. If you want to be able to do 16 gigabytes per second in this platform, it's a little bit of a challenge, but you can get it done. I mean, it's got the cooling, and depending on what SSD you put in there, the controller is going to be in the right place because it's last-gen PCIe 4. SSDs like the Samsung 980 or the Solidime P44 Pro, they locate that in pretty much the right spot. And those SSDs are going to have a read speed of about 6, 7, 8 gigabytes per second, approaching 8 gigabytes per second. So the combined read or write speed of those, yeah, you can get there. Latency is still a little bit of an Achilles heel. You know, drives like Optane or the Samsung 990 Pro or the, the, even the Solidine P44 Pro have some of the class-leading NAND latencies, but they still lose out to drives like Optane in the end. Also, because this is a fully unlocked BIOS, booting from the network is entirely possible. These are dual Intel i225V on our otherwise entirely AMD systems. Dual 2.5 gig NICs on this tiny Lilliputian platform with network booting. You can even run a RAM disk that's fully unlocked in the BIOS. In fact, all of the OEM options as if this system were going to be embedded are there. If you wanted to run embedded DisplayPort and a whole bunch of other options. Now physically those connectors aren't present on the motherboard, but I'm just telling you that because I'm saying that B-Link hasn't hidden anything away. All of the options are there. And yes, even the 65 watt setting out of the box. If you encounter any issues with your B-Link machine, I suggest going to that menu in the BIOS and dialing it down from the 65,000. If you clear the CMOS, I did check, it does reset everything back to the 65 watt default. But sometimes if you run into stability issues or other issues, uh, you can maybe want to dial that back just a little bit to like 54 watts, just to be sure that the Stability issue that you're encountering doesn't come from that. I'm thinking about Linux and alternative use cases here. So out of the box, basically it should be okay. If you get graphical glitches or other problems like that from your B-Link when you first boot it up, almost always this is just a DDR5 training problem or temperature swings or it got jostled in shipping or something like that. Pop the bottom off, pop the gray thing off. It's three screws plus the four screws for the cover and switch around which slot your DIMMs are in. Worst case scenario, 
try taking a Q-tip and a little bit of isopropyl alcohol to clean the edges. If you still don't have a stable system and you get graphical glitches, probably a hardware issue and you probably want to ask for a uh, replacement or send it in for warranty service. The graphical glitches come from the fact that your Radeon 780M that's built into the B-Link is using that DDR5 memory for its video memory and timing and software and things can be a little bit off and then you end up with instability and graphical glitches and the thing crashes. So just something to keep in mind, something to keep an eye on. Let's get into the benchmarks before we do the off-label uses because, oh boy, there's a lot. Benchmarking this thing was a lot of fun. Usually I like to, you know, reset everything and go back to stock drivers, default drivers, latest drivers, WHQL drivers. So this is a Radeon 780M. It's bleeding hot. It's right off the presses. It's uh, not available in drivers. If you go to AMD's website and you look for the 780, it's not really there. If you look for the Ryzen 7 78. 50, it's not there, but there's a Ryzen 9 7845. It's weird. I guess when it launched, there was, but that was a different CPU. This is RDNA 3, but again, it's all in one package. So it's still an APU. Don't expect the same levels of performance that you get from, you know, having a discrete GPU. In fact, that, if we could just ramble in a tangent for a second, the single and multi thread performance of this is going to be breathtaking. And we'll get to that. Don't worry. But it's not the same as a discrete GPU or even another chip in there somewhere that is acting as a GPU. There are other mini PCs, for example, that implement, you know, the Radeon 6600M, which is a dedicated GPU piece of silicon. So inside the box, there's a CPU and there's a GPU, and still within that 120 watt power budget. That probably won't be that way in the future, in the not too distant future, because the onboard GPU is going to be capable enough that no one will really want to add another chip to do graphics processing. I mean, why, why, why two and one will do? And that's kind of what we're starting to see here with the 7000 series processors. It's not really far off single and multi-thread for eight cores performance that you would get from a desktop class processor. The place where it's lagging behind a little bit is in the GPU. But it feels wrong to say that it's lagging behind because it's actually class leading in terms of APU performance. The 780M is no slouch. It's just that if I had a choice of a 6000 series embedded processor plus a 6600M embedded GPU in a small form factor machine, I would probably take that, especially if I had an eye toward gaming, versus the APU route. But mostly I was interested in productivity and eight cores and the horsepower that, that gives me, maybe a developer workstation with some light esports gaming, then the 780M is gonna do it for me. I mean, we can get 1080p performance, especially if you use FSR2, but let's take a look at the benchmarks and break it down a little bit more. DDR5 5600 out of the box with latency of 91 nanoseconds, at least according to ADA64, which is not the most perfect program if we're being honest for this. It's not bad for out-of-the-box defaults, but it does leave a lot of room for tuning. It is sort of bog-standard crucial memory though, so uh, it's fine for something in this form factor. Again, a Radeon 780M really does benefit from the higher memory clocks and everything else, but you can introduce a little bit of instability, because it's using the system memory as video memory, that's why that is. Single core and multi core scores in Geekbench, of course, are breathtaking. Over 2,500 points for single core and almost 10,000 points for multi core. Keep in mind, this is only an eight core part, and we're still in our tiny, tiny power envelope window. Looking at this on the kilowatt, we're barely over 70 watts, 75 watts, something like that, most of the time. It can burst a little bit higher, but it backs off pretty quickly. So, the 120 watt power brick here. Probably overkill, but that does give you a lot of room on the USB Type-C ports on the back, as well as the USB Type-A ports, which seem to be good for up to 27 watts, give or take, just doing some informal testing. So, nice. All while I'm doing this, our Hardware Info 64 results and our benchmark results show 70 to 85 degrees C at most, which is very impressive for this <laughs> cooling solution. Good job, B-Link. The fingerprint sensor is an Edgestec EGIS TEC fingerprint sensor, which is pretty well known to the Linux community, but support can be a little hit and miss depending on your distro. I experimented with it a little bit and it seemed like it enrolled my fingerprint okay, and I'm not sure if it was working because I'd also enrolled my fingerprint on the Windows side or the Linux side. I really think if you're going to count on the fingerprint sensor to work, you probably should hit me up in the forums and let's go from there because 
those kinds of biometrics on Linux, mm, a little sketchy. Now, of course, on Windows, fingerprint sensor, Windows Hello, all that worked perfectly well. IRQ not less or equal. What's he doing to it? Now the B-Link GTR is a unique device for B-Link as well as the form factor and everything else. I mean, don't forget this part was built for a laptop, but it's also unique in the market. I mean, dual M.2, dual 2.5 gigabit NICs that are actually a reputable and good chipset. It's a really powerful system. You might've noticed a couple of times, especially around 14 minutes into the video, that I had a weird glitch. Well, it turns out mine died, developed a mysterious issue and, uh, it died. My unit was pre-production and it died. I'm not really sure why it developed an issue, but getting a replacement, not really a big deal if that happens to you. So I don't think it will though. I think it's pretty rare. I think these things are, are tested pretty well. <laughs> this almost made it through all of the Windows setup and it didn't die until I uh, did a lot of burn-in testing on it. And for the test results, I mean, for the benchmarking and everything else that I got through, it's a pretty solid system. It just died fairly quickly. So if you pick up one of these and something like that happens to you, uh, reach out and let me know what your support experiences are. This is a fire breathing, powerful little machine. I'm very, very impressed with it. And the fact that mine died doesn't really detract in my mind from the overall platform because it is well engineered. I mean, it's a, it's a vapor chamber. I got to do a tear down. Maybe we can do a, uh, a repair or something in a level one diagnostic video. I don't know, but still, even, you know, stuff like that happens, I'm gonna take it in stride, and I'm sure this isn't the last that we're gonna see of the GTR from B-Link. I'm Wildless Level One, I'm signing out, and you can find me in the Level One forums. Mm -hmm.